Good morning, everybody, and welcome. It's great to see everybody here this morning. Everyone's excited, having conversations off of a wonderful Thanksgiving couple of days. I hope you had a chance to uh, reflect and be thankful for many things that God has blessed us with. Uh, it is interesting when you think about giving thanks and how we have so much to be thankful for, knowing that we have a hope uh, and someone to give that thanks to. Um, I, I uh, oftentimes wonder how it feels when you give thanks and you're not quite sure what you're thanking. But we know we have a hope, uh, we have a God in heaven, and we have a future that is with Him, and we are excited for that. So I hope you had a chance to reflect on that and be thankful for so many things. As we come together, we come and we sing praises to a God who is mighty and powerful, uh, and I hope you are ready to uh, pour out your hearts to Him and have a lesson from His word of encouragement. Let's stand together as we sing. <clears throat> He is Jehovah, God of creation. He is Jehovah, Lord God Almighty, the balm of Gilead, the rock of ages. He is Jehovah, the God that healeth thee. Sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah. He is Jehovah. Lord God Almighty, He is Jehovah, the God that healeth thee. He is the great I Am, the God of Abraham. Jehovah Shalom, the God of peace I Am, the God of Israel, the everlasting One. He is Jehovah, the God that healeth thee. Sing Alleluia, sing Alleluia, sing Alleluia, sing Alleluia. He is Jehovah, Lord God Almighty. He is Jehovah, the God that healeth thee. He's your provider, Jehovah Jireh, God of salvation. God of Messiah, the Son He sent to you, He testified of Him. He is Jehovah, the God that He let me. Sing Alleluia, sing Alleluia, sing Alleluia, sing Alleluia. He is Jehovah, Lord God Almighty. He is Jehovah, the God that healeth thee. Sing Alleluia, sing Alleluia, sing Alleluia, sing Alleluia. He is Jehovah, Lord God Almighty. He is Jehovah, the God that healeth thee. He is Jehovah, the God that healeth thee. Hear the holy roar of God resound. Watch the waters part before us now. Come and see what He has done for us. Tell the world of His great love. Our God is a God who saves. Our God is a God who saves. Let God arise, let God arise. Our God reigns now and forever. He reigns now and forever. Arise, let God arise. Our God reigns now and forever. He reigns now and forever. His enemies will run for sure. The church will stand, she will endure. He holds the keys of thy Father. Death has no sting, no final word. Our God is a God who saves. Our God is a God who saves. Let God arise, let God arise. Our God reigns now and forever. He reigns now and forever. Arise, let God arise. Our 
our God reigns now and forever. He reigns now and forever. Our God is a God who saves. Our God is a God who saves. Let God arise. Let God arise. Our God reigns now and forever. He reigns now and forever. Arise. Let God arise. Our God reigns now and forever. He reigns now and forever. Let God arise. Salvation belongs to our God who sits upon the throne and unto the Lamb be praise and glory wisdom and thanks honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever be to our God forever and ever be to our God forever and ever Amen and we the redeemed shall be strong in purpose and in unity declaring aloud praise and glory wisdom and thanks honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever be to our God forever and ever be to our God forever and ever amen be to our God forever and ever be to our God forever and ever be to our God forever and ever amen please be seated let us pray Almighty God, our Father, we are so grateful. We're grateful for the privilege that we have to call you our Father. And we're thankful that you gave us your son, Jesus, to reconcile us to yourself. We marvel, dear God, at the creation, and we thank you for the spirit that you allow to live in us that comforts us and guide us in our lives. Father, we ask your blessings upon our preacher, Jeff and Isaac, our elders, deacons, and all those who labor to provide the kind of leadership in teaching and guiding us in this congregation. And we rejoice, dear Father, in the decision that Ryan and Emily have made. And we ask you to guide each of us in our response to that decision. Help us to be a people who will support them, guide them, and support the efforts that this congregation is embarking on. Father, there are many things that we as your people struggle with and we know that 
the struggles that we have many times are driven by our own arrogance, our own failings. But we marvel at the fact that you continue to love us, you continue to care for us, you continue to forgive us. Help us, Father, to have a desire to teach the gospel in this area, but teach it by the way we live, in serving and loving one another, in serving and loving our community. Father, help us to be mindful of your word as we go about our jobs and be reminded of who we are as we work, as we teach, as we study as students, that we are doing all of these things for Jesus. Help us to keep that in our minds. We live in a world that is filled with turmoil and war and division and evil. We recognize that we are a people who should be a light in this darkness. And we pray, dear Father, for the rulers of this world. Help them to realize that their power and their authority is given to them by you. We acknowledge our stubbornness. We acknowledge our failings. And we are grateful that we are redeemed by your mercy and your grace. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for this body that meets in this place. Thank you for Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Steve, you hit the clicker. You hit the clicker. It's okay. I found it. We're good. I was I was in panic mode. Like, who has the clicker? John, do you have the clicker? John's like, I don't know where the clicker is. I'll bet Steve stashed it up here somewhere. And sure enough. <laughs> good morning. Welcome. Hope everybody had a good Thanksgiving. It's good to be here. Uh, good to spend time with family this week. Uh, welcome if you're joining us online. Welcome if you're a visitor. We're especially glad that you're here. And uh, we want to welcome you. And ask, uh, if we'd love to have some information about you. If you don't mind, the easiest way to do that is to use the QR code on the seat back in front of you, which will take you to this page, and you can fill out the connection card. Then we'll know who you are and how we can get in touch with you if we need to. We would appreciate that. A couple quick uh, uh, reminders. Uh, one, a request for prayer. As you know, we have these uh, care communities that we've got going in the community where we're helping to support foster families and uh, working with the Pennsylvania Orphan Care Alliance that just got renamed, and I can't remember their new name. Uh, but the first, the first team has been working for a little while, Team 1. They got a person assigned very quickly, and so they've been doing their thing for a while. The second team just got their person, uh, this, their family, and it's another large family with a bunch of foster kids that we're going to be supporting. And so I'll be praying for them as they start. Uh, the family is up in Lidditz, and I think January 1st is the target date there. So lots to, lots to do there, and uh, it's just very exciting to see us out in the community and showing the love of Jesus in that way. Along the same lines, remember that we've been collecting money. Daphne Tarabarelli has, has been coordinating our, our annual uh, drive to provide gifts for kids in the CV School District who don't have money for Christmas presents and things. And so I uh, appreciate Daphne coordinating that. And she really needs money today. So cash or check, gift cards, uh, isn't it today? We need today money every day. Well... <laughs> That's another conversation. If you got any plumbing work that needs done, you know, Rich could use the work. No. Uh, okay, so she's got to get the money to the to the school by Wednesday, I think, Wednesday or Thursday. So if you forgot, great news. You can also use the QR code on the seat back in front of you. Go out to the website. It'll take you to this page. Or if you have the Simple Church app, uh, there is on the drop-down menu under funds. Go to the one that says CV Schools. Put your gift in there. 
and that money will filter into Daphne in time to get it into the hands of these families who want to give it to them in time for them to go shop and, and buy gifts and things. It's a really good thing. And so we were able to help a lot of families last year, and we want to do that again this year. So again, thank you to Daphne for coordinating that. So since the beginning of, uh, of November, I, I've been talking about, uh, you know, stepping away from some of the things that we have in our lives that have been consuming us. And so we've talked about politics, taking a break from some of that, social media, media in general. Uh, so for some of us, it's our hobbies. For some of us, it's just screens in general, things that take a lot of our time that probably are not worth or worthy of as much time as we give it. And in particular, I've been, I've been challenging you. I've been challenging myself. And so this is not like you should do this. I'm not going to do this. But I've really been trying to think about these last two months and, and embracing it as a time of thanksgiving and joy, thinking about incarnation, thinking about celebration, thinking about all these incredible things that we have to be thankful for and the blessings in our lives, the people in our lives, this church in our lives, and really just trying to refocus things. And, and really to try, as I've been saying over and over again, let's figure out you know, what it means for us to be God's kingdom people in 2023. Let's figure that out individually as a group of individual Christians. Let's figure that out as a church. Let's make sure that as we take these last two months and, and try to soak up and absorb and appreciate all the good things in life, let's think about the future. Let's think about what God wants from us. And uh, we typically do this as we enter a new year. <clears throat> I just want us to spend a, more of an extended time doing that this year and to think maybe more strategically. And so I appreciate it. By the way, Steve, I didn't mean to give you a hard time. I appreciate the break from preaching last week. It's nice to have a week to not have to prepare a sermon. And so thank you for the break. But I also want to say I really appreciated Steve's words last week. It was a great message. And also a very practical thing there. If you're thinking about how can I refocus my life? How can I think about going forward? Who does God want me to be? Who does God want us to be? I think Steve gave us a really good tool for doing that, to, to think strategically with God about where, who we are and where we're going. And so uh, I think that just fit in, and we, even though we didn't talk about it in that sense, it fit in very well with, you know, what I, as I'm trying to think about the end of the year and, and the next stages of life. And so I, I'm thankful for that. Um, and so we enter this home stretch. We're getting ready for the new year. And as we do this, I, I, I want to continue this thought process, and I, I want us to tackle something today or to begin to tackle something it's going to take a couple of weeks because it's a little bit bigger than this idea of, of making some resolutions. And so I want, to, I want to ask you to move along with me to consider what I'm going to ask you to do today. And over the next couple of weeks, I want us each to spend some time contemplating this question. What is the meaning of life? I mean, surely you've got like a five word answer to that, right? Everybody does. Uh, you know, we all need something light and, and, you know, easy to think about. After a week of heavy meals, we've been dining heavy, so let's, let's lighten our load a little bit. Let's think about the meaning of life. Uh, that's kind of a scary question, isn't it? I mean, sometimes if somebody, if, if somebody sits down across from you with a cup of coffee and says, so tell me, what do you think the meaning of life is? You're kind of inclined to do one of those, right? The meaning of life is, is a scary thing to contemplate. If, if you really spend some time really thinking about it, I mean, really digging deep, it's one of those things that kind of makes your head pound a little bit. If you got, if your watch or your fitness device is monitoring your heart rate, you might, you might notice the, 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 the chart going up a little bit as you try to think about, you know, how do you answer this question? And yet, you know, as human beings, we are inquisitive beings, right? Since God made us, we've been asking questions. We've been trying to figure out how the world works. And there may not be any more common or fundamental question that humans have asked down through our existence than this question. What is the meaning of life? Why are we here? What are we doing? And it's no surprise as you think about it that you know, you've know given all these thousands of years of human existence, that especially what we have as recorded history. It's no surprise that different people have come to different conclusions. And so you can make your head hurt as well just trying to get a handle on some of these great philosophies of life as people have contemplated this question. And so, yeah, some people have concluded, what is the meaning of life? Well, the meaning of life is you got to live for the moment, right? It's uh, you only live once. And so this is what we call hedonism. It's just go out and do anything you want to do because that's what, the, that's what you boil life down to. It's just live for the moment. Other people have said, well, it's more like, uh, you know, we need to do what's best. The meaning of life is to do what's best for the most people. And so that's called pragmatism, doing what is practical, the greatest good for the most number of people. And then, of course, too many people have just concluded that life has no meaning, right? And that's, that's nihilism. And that's the idea that, 
It doesn't really matter. Life is meaningless. Life is meaningless and then you die. And so what's the point of it all? And you probably, you probably know some people like that in your life. You have some of those folks in your existence. I, uh, one of the greatest answers that I've ever heard uh, comes from a, a famous science fiction book. Douglas Adams is the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And at some point they feed this question. There's a, a supercomputer, a fictional supercomputer in the book, his name is Deep Thought, and they filter this question to the supercomputer, what is the meaning of life? And the supercomputer spits out, 42. You know, maybe that's as good an answer as a lot of those philosophies. You know, it, it, there's, maybe there's some reason behind that. I don't know. I just, I thought it was funny, 42. Uh, and, and you feel free to use that. It's not mine. It's Douglas Adams. So if somebody says, what's the meaning of life? Just say 42 and move on. It's, it's simpler that way. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to take a stab at this question over the next couple of weeks. We're going to do it from a very specific biblical perspective, which is what you would expect from a sermon, I'm sure. But uh, you should know I'm not going to tell you when we get to the end that this is everything the Bible has to say on this subject. I'm not going to tell you that this one answer is the only answer from the Bible about what, what the meaning of life is. And, and in fact, you would probably have when we get to the end say, well, I get that. But I also get this from another place in Scripture. That's fine. But I think it's important that we consider this one perspective, uh, this one answer that we really need to ponder. And so before we do that, I want to challenge you with a pre-question. Um, you're here today, and so you're kind of stuck, but you're not going to be stuck for the next three or four weeks. You can choose to, to engage with this or to not engage with this. Uh, but I think it's important that we kind of start here. And, and the pre-question is, do you really want to know how life works? Do you, do you want to know how life really works? Do you want to know? We would all say, oh, of course. But inside, sometimes we're not that way, right? Some of us, we're having some health issues. We go to the doctor uh, and we, the doctor does the diagnosis, runs the test. He comes back in with this piece of paper and we look at the doctor and we say to the doctor, whatever it is, I want to know, right? Give it to me straight. I can deal with whatever. I don't care if it's bad news. I just want to know, I want the truth. And some of us, when that doctor walks into the room, we're going, if it's bad news, don't tell me, right? I just, I just want to go on with my life. If I've got a week to live or whatever, I'd rather live in ignorance. I'd rather go on my way and think everything is fine. Some of us are wired that way, right? You don't have to confess who you are, but you know who you are. So which are you? If you'd rather not know the truth about the meaning of life, if you'd prefer to, frankly, live in delusion, <laughs> this study's not going to be for you. Uh, so uh, we're going to do some introductory material today that I don't think will damage you too much. If you just kind of want to go, la, 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 don't tell me anymore. You can, you can do that after today. You can move on and you'll be fine. For the rest of us, I want to ask you to turn, believe it or not, to the Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes. Now, it is fine. If you don't know where that is, that's what indexes are for, right? So go to the index. You don't have, nobody's going to look down at you if you've got to figure that out. If you've got a Bible app, you're doing that anyway, right? You're just thumbing through. <laughs> Get to Ecclesiastes. There's a good chance that you haven't read it ever or you've read, you haven't read it in a long time. There's a really good chance that you started reading it and you got to the second verse and you said, I'm out. And that's OK, too. Uh, we'll talk a little bit today about why you need to read past that second verse. But I get it. And so uh, get to Ecclesiastes. You know that the Bible is one book, but it's really not one book, right? It's one volume. It's made up of 66 books. And there are a lot of ways to look at those books. One of the most important ways is to read each of the books as an individual type of literature, because we read different types of literature in different ways. And so in the Bible, you find history, but you also find poetry. You don't read history the same way you read poetry. And so you need to understand that. In the Bible, there are, there's books of law. There's, there's books of apocalypse, which is the stuff that we think we want to read until we get in the middle of it. And then we're like, oh, that's terrifying. I don't want to read it anymore. And then in the Bible, there are books described as books of wisdom. Now, we believe certainly that all scripture being, you know, the word of God, God breathed, all scripture contains wisdom. All scripture is wise. But there are some books that really are in there because the purpose of the books is read this and you'll learn how to live more wisely. You'll learn how to live from the perspective of godly wisdom instead of earthly wisdom. And so those books are in there. Uh, they are mostly found in the New Testament or excuse me, in the Old Testament. And there are three in particular that I think sort of work together. <laughs> excuse me. And what they do is they help us. If, these, if you can kind of connect these three books, they sort of help you have... 
<coughs> sorry, they sort of help you have a, a realistic picture of how life works, which you may want to know or you may not. But nevertheless, if you're going to read them, it's going to tell you. And so the best known and the most read book of wisdom is the book of Proverbs. And many of you probably read through Proverbs. It has these great little phrases that kind of stick in your mind. And so Proverbs is generally an optimistic book. It's a book that kind of makes you feel encouraged. It makes you feel light. It makes you feel like, okay, I can go out and do this. I can break this off into manageable chunks and I can kind of fit this into my life. And so Proverbs works that way. And basically what Proverbs, what Proverbs is saying is here's some good advice to live by. And if you do these things, life's going to go pretty good. If you do these things, you're roughly going to be aligning your life with God's perspective on what your life should be like, and your life is going to go well. And so, for example, here's, here's a passage, Proverbs chapter 10, verse 27. The fear of the Lord adds length to life, but the years of the wicked are cut short. I mean, that's kind of short and sweet. Now, of course, the way that Bible wisdom functions is it's not a guarantee. This is not a promise from God that this is absolutely going to happen. Basically, uh, what, it, what the Bible's wisdom literature is saying is, is if you do this, this is what's most likely to happen. Live this way and your odds of this outcome are far greater than if you live this way. And so basically what you might say here is, you know, uh, if you live as a wicked person, the things that wicked people tend to do, duh, tend to shorten their lives. Wicked people tend to do dangerous things. Wicked people tend to do self-destructive things. And so if that's you, if you're living according to this pattern, chances are you're not going to live as long as somebody who doesn't make those choices. But you should also recognize that sometimes a good person crosses the street and gets run over by a bus. So it's not a guarantee that live a good life, live to be 100. But the odds are better if you're doing smart things with your life instead of wicked things. Now, there are exceptions, again, to these wisdom principles. And so basically, and I think you can relate to this, sometimes you follow the rules, right? Sometimes you do what is supposed to be the wise thing, but you get to the end and you don't get the promised result. Or you don't get the result that you were expecting. And you kind of go back and think, well, I thought if I did it this way, I would have this outcome, but now I'm over here. And so how do you deal with that? How do you explain that? And really, the, the answer to that lies somewhere in the nature of existence, which is where we start to get a little metaphysical. There are things about life in a fallen world, a world that is full of sin. There are things about living in a world like that that are unjust, that, are, that seem unfair, right? That it should be this way, but it's not. It's really this way. There are things about, about this life, this existence that we have that are, that are illogical, right? They just they don't make sense. There are things about life that is kind of unfulfilling. You think you're going to do something that matters and, and then you discover that it doesn't matter. And so uh, we wrestle with that. And in the scriptures, we can watch somebody else wrestle with that. Uh, we can watch somebody else answer, ask these same questions. Uh, the same kind of reality that we find ourselves in sometimes is where he finds himself. And that's what we're going to be talking about here in Ecclesiastes. And so again, if you're not there, get there. That's the second of the three Old Testament wisdom books, the main ones. The third one, by the way, is, uh, is a book that helps to give us a realistic perspective on, on how the world really works because, uh, well, it's the book of Job. And really what Job is, is boiled down to is a question that a lot of us have struggled with, which is, you know, how do you, how do you still trust God when your experience of life is that life is unfair? And so Job kind of puts that last piece of the puzzle in there so that we can sort of have a realistic picture of how the world works and, and what it's like to live a life of wisdom. We're going to say Proverbs and Job for another day. Uh, and um, what Ecclesiastes is going to help us to do is, again, to see, to see life as it really is. To, to be able to look at, at life and our existence with clear eyes. I got to tell you, you know, a dose of reality is not always pleasant, right? A dose of reality is not always what we want. I would submit a dose of reality is always what we need. And in fact, that, that knowing the truth about life and how it works and what God wants from us, what, what to do and what not to do, these are things that will enable us to make better decisions about how to live. And that's really what we're talking about. How can we go out into the world and live the way God wants us to live? That's, we would all say, well, we want that. I want that. So how do we do that? Ecclesiastes is going to help us to do that. This is not going to be a full systematic study of this book. We're not going to go through uh, page by page, although I, I encourage you to take the next month and read it. It's 12 chapters. Um, if you just read it, it's a quick read because it's a lot of dialogue in a sense, or well, it's not, it's a, it's a monologue, but it's not a long story. 
Uh, you can read it pretty quickly if you just read it and just, just to get through it. I, I got to tell you if, you, if you pause and contemplate, it'll take you a lot longer <laughs> because there's things that the writers are going to bring up that you're going to go, oh, I hadn't really thought about that. I need to chew on that a little bit. But however you do it, I encourage you to go through and to read that uh, over the next month and to take advantage of this opportunity. But really to, to fully appreciate the greater truths that this book has for us, there's a couple, a couple key truths, a couple key things we need to keep in mind that I think will help you as you read. So one of these, the first of these, is that Ecclesiastes, in a, aside from being, we believe all scripture comes from God and is inspired by the Holy Spirit, but that's, you know, that's the God part of this, but, but really there are two human voices in Ecclesiastes. And it's easy to miss these as you read, but I think this will help you read with a little more clarity because there are gonna be times when you're like, wait a minute, why is, he, why is he using those pronouns and things there? And so you need to know that there are two people writing this. And so one person is kind of a narrator. Um, he's basically reporting on wisdom that is coming from somebody else. This other person has these ideas about wisdom and the narrator is helping to communicate those to us. Uh, and so he's easy to miss if you don't know what's going on there. Uh, and in particular, he's going to have a couple of comments at the end of the book that are really going to help us pull this all together and understand, okay, that, that's how all of these pieces fit together. That's what I need to know going forward. Uh, this is the, the essence. And so the narrator is very valuable. The one, the one dispensing the actual wisdom is enigmatic, mysterious. Uh, generally, over, over history, we've attributed this book as, uh, to being written by Solomon, or the, at least Solomon is the one who, who is dispensing the wisdom here. Uh, there are a lot of good reasons to think that that's true. It, it might be true. Uh, his description of himself seems to fit that, and as you read, you'll notice, oh yeah, that kind of sounds like Solomon. Um, more recent scholarship has sort of challenged that, and, and maybe the idea that this is somebody else, or there's a few other options. It doesn't really matter that much. We're not going to worry about that. What you need to know is most translations will, in fact, describe him as, uh, as the preacher. Um, now, in, in, yeah, there's one from, well, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. The preacher. So there, he's got a technical term. It starts with a Q. We're not going to worry about that. Some translations, like the NIV, will say the teacher. But for obvious reasons, I kind of like that this guy is called the preacher in most versions. So that's kind of how we're, we're going to be coming at that. But whoever he is... This is somebody who has lived, right? This is somebody who, who has uh, had the full human experience. This is somebody who has been there, done that, and you know, brought home the, the refrigerator magnet to show where he's been and what he's done. This is somebody who has just done everything you can imagine doing. Uh, he's learned a lot. Through all of his experiences, he's made some uh, assumptions, and a lot of his assumptions about life and how the world works have been shattered. And so he's trying to deal with that. And so he's looking for meaning. Right? We're all looking for meaning. He's looking for meaning in all sorts of places, but he is struggling to find what he's been looking for. And the places where he's been looking that he, assu he assumes meaning is going to be there, he hasn't found it there. And I think in that sense, a lot of us can relate to this, this journey personally. Or if you can't, if you've never had that journey, you probably have somebody in your life who is on that journey. They're trying to figure it out. They're looking for what life means and what they can do with their life. And, and they're just not sure. And you think, well, they're looking, looking in the wrong places. But sometimes even when they seem to be looking in the right places, they're not getting the right answers. And so we can relate to this. As, 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 uh, excuse me, as we start, I think it's good to know what motivates him. And this comes at the end. This is the narrator. And this is the narrator telling us in summary that what the preacher does here is he has this idea about, I'm going to have these experiences. I'm going to share my experiences. My experiences are going to bring joy to my readers. That's how he sets out. I, I want to provide joy. But in the end, what he concludes is, I've discovered some things that are true that no, won't necessarily make you happy. And it's more important that I communicate what is true to you than just tell you what you want to hear. And so I love that about him. I appreciate I appreciate about that about him. I think that's that's what we're all hoping for. Is we want to know what's true. We don't just want to we want to go where truth takes us, right? And so that's what this journey is going to be about. The other thing that we need to keep in mind as we read this, I think, is probably the key to at least you know beginning to under, understand and unlock some of the mysteries of this book, and it has to do with with a word. There is a word in this text that is repeated, believe it or not, thirty-eight times, and so. 
in, in Bible study, one of the things you look for is if the writer keeps repeating himself, but that's important. We probably ought to pause and think about that. So this is the word. It is, uh, there's the Hebrew. If any of you can speak Hebrew, God bless you. Uh, I would just take the easy way out and call it Hebel. Hebel is the word, 38 times it appears. Um, and the thing is, all the different Bible translations, boy, they try to get to the essence of this word, and they, they, all, they all struggle. Because as it turns out, as happens frequently, when you try to take a word in one language and move it into another language, there's some stuff that just doesn't, it just doesn't translate. You get part of the meaning, but you don't capture the whole essence of the meaning. And this apparently is one of those words. It's, it's hard to grasp what Hebel really means. So Hebel can, can describe something that is unsubstantial. It can describe something that, that is fleeting, or what we would say lacking in permanence, temporary. Hebel can describe that kind of thing. It, it refers to something that you can see, you can recognize, you know what it is, you can perhaps see its influence, but, but you can't quite hold on to it. That's Hebel. Now, a lot of translations, they, they settle on words like this to try to describe what it means. And this is where, if you, you know, maybe you read to verse 2 and you're like, ah, okay, everything is meaningless. I don't want to read the rest of this. But, but these are some of the words that many different translations have put in there to try to capture the essence of this. But I think this sends us off in the wrong direction. Everything is not meaningless. Life is not meaningless. If you get to the end of Ecclesiastes, and that is your conclusion, nothing matters, everything is meaningless, it doesn't matter what I do, it doesn't matter, my life is, is meaningless, it's inconsequential, I think you have gone down the wrong path. And what is ironic is I think that, that this word makes a lot more sense if we, in this case, just kind of translate it more literally. And what's really ironic is the one translation that I found that sort of does that is a translation I normally never read and would never refer people to. It is the very loose paraphrase called the message. And so I never preach out of the message. It's bizarre. But in this case, it kind of nails it. Ecclesiastes 1, 1 and 2, the message says smoke. Nothing but smoke. There's nothing to anything. It's all smoke. That's very different than meaningless, right? That's a whole different thing. But Hebel literally means like vapor. It means mist. It means breath. It's, it's something you can feel. You can see what it does. But do you ever try to like, oh, let's see if we can hold that fog. Do you ever try to do that? Or, oh, I just scoop some smoke here out of the campfire and do something with that. You can't do it. And I like this in particular because I think, you know, the, the New Testament's only book of wisdom, at least I think it's a book of wisdom, the book of James, also kind of goes in that direction when it talks about life, right? We know this verse from James chapter 4, why, you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You're a mist. Some of your translations that you read from probably say you're a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Don't get discouraged by that. There's more to talk about. But, but this is kind of what we're talking about here. And I think maybe the best way, the best word for us to plug in here might be the word breath. The way to think about this. Because breath reminds us of how finite life is. It reminds us of how intangible life is under the sun, how, how life is limited. So think about this, you know, read this as everything is breath. Everything is breath. Life, as you experience it, it's like, it's like breath. I, I, just, I just breathed. Did you all catch that? That's kind of what you know I did. But you can't see it. You can't grab it. This, is, this will help us because so much of life, so much of life can't be grasped. So much of our existence every day is just very unfulfilling, right? Maybe you have some things that make you feel like you're accomplishing something, but an awful lot of life is, is just pretty unfulfilling and it doesn't make sense. And so, so many of the things that we live our life for are a waste of life. And if you really want to come down to it, they're a waste of breath. We invest a lot of energy into things that are a waste of breath. The preacher's going to have some tough words for us. He's going to have some words that some of us are not going to really want to hear. But he wants us to see life for what it is. You know, he wants us to stop deluding ourselves and to make the most of our lives. And I think that's what most of us want too. Don't we want to make the most of our lives? That's what we want. One more thing as we close today and as I leave you with that idea that everything is breath. 
Today, uh, perhaps the thing that we most need to hear when we get to the end of Ecclesiastes is something I wanna, I wanna tease a little bit at the beginning, and I hope that you'll see it more clearly as we get to the end. Um, but here, here is a sense of it, and that is that how should you live your life in light of reality? You should live your life backwards. Um, when you get to the end of your life, imagine you get to the end of your life. None of us knows when that's going to be, but imagine you could get to the end of your life. You're, you're on this, somewhere on this cycle that you see on the side screens, and you have the opportunity to get to the end of your life where you know I'm about to breathe my last breath, and that my life is going to end. And I'm gonna look back over my life with this last breath. What do you hope that your life will have amounted to? As you look back over the entire scope of your life, whether you live to be, I don't know, 23 or 103, as you look back, what do you hope your life will have amounted to? Will it be something that was lasting? Will it be something that mattered? Will you be able to go back and say, oh yes, these things made a difference. Will you be able to do that? I don't know about you, you know, the older I get, the more I think about stuff like that. 56th birthday last week. Um, time is moving fast. We're going to talk about that too in this series. Sometimes you look back and you think about the paths that you didn't take. You get, you get to a crossroads and you're your options. You go this way. What if, I had, what if I had gone this way? You ever have those moments? I have, I have those moments or maybe choices that you would have made differently. Sometimes we even have regrets, right? Oh, I wish that I had done this instead of that. And these are the things that, that are on our minds as we look back over, over our lives. Whatever those things are that you hope your life will have amounted to when you get to the end, whatever, whatever will have given your life significance in your mind after you're gone, Ecclesiastes says, start living toward those things now. Don't wait till you get to the end to look back and say, oh, I could have zigged instead of zagged. Live now imagining that you're looking back. What do I want to have done? What should I have accomplished? Who should I have been? That's the thing to start living now. Live life backwards. Because at some point your life is going to come to an end. So let the end of your life shape your priorities. Let the end of your life shape your goals, your ambitions. But don't wait till the end of your life. Let it happen today. Let the end of your life shape those things today. Why wait? You don't know when your end is going to come. But while you're still, you know, drawing breath, you have a chance to refocus your life on the things that matter. Or not. It's your choice. Decide. So let me leave you with a challenge today as we begin. I, I, well, I guess two challenges. I would encourage you again to read Ecclesiastes. Just wrestle with it. Go through it. There's a lot of stuff we're not going to get to that you might enjoy anyway. But the challenge for this week is that as you think about your life and as you're, as you're thinking about where you're headed, think, think bigger than just where you want to be next year. Think bigger than that. No matter how old you are, no matter how young you are, it is not too early. It is not too late to start considering your life now in light of the end of your life. I want to recommend to you today that you start to live life backwards. Let's stand together. Let's sing. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. Beauty that made this heart adore you. Hope of a life spent with you. Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to be. King of all day, all so highly exalted, glorious in heaven. Say that.
you're my God. You're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. And I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon the cross. I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon the cross. Here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, you're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to be. Beauty that made this heart adore you, a hope of a life spent with you. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. When darkness seems to hide His face, I rest on His unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of all. When He shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in Him be found, dressed in His right. Justness alone, faultless stand before the throne. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of all. Well, Jeff, I want to thank you for I was a little concerned that uh, what I was to present was going to be too deep. I don't have that concern anymore. <laughs>
Uh, just uh, administratively, if you did not pick up uh, uh, the emblems, uh, raise your hand, someone can get that for you. We tend to validate our beliefs and practices as a, a church by comparing them with what we think of as the first century church. I know I've done this uh, on many occasions. However, as I have recently learned our, or at least my perception of the first century church is only loosely connected to history. John McConkie has been teaching a class on the Old Testament and his first lesson, he referenced a book, The Story of Christianity by Justo Gonzalez. And at my wife's urging, we reached out and bought the book and I have been wading through it. Uh, I'm one of the few courses in high school that I did not do well in was world history. And this reminds me of that. Um, but in the process, I've had my perceptions of the first century church challenged. I tended to think of the first century church as a kind of idyllic period with persecution, but uh, because of their proximity and time to the days when Jesus walked and talked with the disciples and taught them, that they had the best grasp on the teaching, teachings of Jesus as it pertains to how the church was to function. I have learned, however, that this was a very turbulent period of history. When the church leaders were having to deal with one crisis after another, brought on by a rapidly changing political and religious environment. And while they, like us, had the Holy Spirit to guide them, it wasn't like with Moses. Uh, God usually didn't directly communicate with them. They had to learn how to let the Spirit guide them. It's obvious that eventually the church leaders drifted from Jesus' teachings. But I think during the first few centuries after Pentecost, the church leaders were just trying the best they could to adapt to the pressures um, of a changing world while trying to apply the principles that Jesus taught. Today, I would like us to think a little bit about the, how the first century church implemented the Lord's Supper. And to start this exercise, I want you to first think about your plans for today. If you stay for one of the classes after our worship service ends, you'll probably still leave the building by about 11. Are you going to do some early Christmas shopping? Or we'll watch a football game? Uh, or perhaps you'll be having relatives over that you didn't get a chance to meet with uh, over Thanksgiving. Or maybe, perhaps you were hoping that the elves in their downtime before the holidays would show up and do your Thanksgiving dishes for you. Since that didn't happen, can't put elf any longer. Whatever the case, you probably have plans. Consider the early church in Jerusalem on a Sunday. They didn't have cars. And most of the early Christians came from lower classes, and so they probably didn't have chariots or wagons. So they probably walked. Um, and that could have easily been a mile or more as the crow flies, to get from where they lived to the temple where the, the earliest church uh, meetings were held. Um, and I suspect that would account for the early Christians spending considerably more time together on a Sunday than we do now. Traveling to the temple to worship and traveling home probably took most of the day. One perception that I had wrong was how the early Christians viewed themselves and were viewed by others. 
they did not view Christianity as a new religion. They were Jews. They followed Jewish traditions. What separated them from the Jews who were not Christians was the belief that the Messiah, whom all Jews had been waiting for, had come. And salvation was through Jesus and not through strict obedience to the law. Non-Christians viewed Christians as a fringe, fringe sect of the Jews, as did the Romans. Many of the Jews believed that the persecution that they were experiencing at the hands of the Romans was God's punishment for them straying from the law. And so this other sect that has arisen was just another reason why God might pour out his wrath on them. So a lot of the early persecution came from the non-Christian Jews. Persecutions at the hands of the Romans came because the Jews and Christians refused to worship the Hellenistic gods and those Roman leaders who wanted to be worshipped as gods. Um, starting with Alexander the Great uh, and on through the Roman period, there was a concept of Hellenization. And that was the Romans had to put down a lot of uh, insurrections. And so the concept was, if we can get everybody believing the same thing, having the same traditions, having the same religions, we won't have so many battles over all these little groups rising up. But the Christians and the Jews weren't going to go along with that. Uh, now, it was early in the second century when the Gentile Christian numbers increased and the Romans recognized that Christianity was more than just a sect of Judaism. And at that point, they started persecuting the Christians because they were Christians. These persecutions came in waves and often related to strife between the Jews and local government. And it is believed that just before Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed in 70 AD, the church leaders moved the church to a town near Nazareth called Pelham. Or Pella. In this context, the early Christians became secretive about their meetings, and only baptized believers could be there. In fact, some of the early buildings that where Christians met had catacombs, and that's where they would hold communion so that they, they wouldn't be found out. I found it interesting that they did not focus on the suffering and death of Jesus while celebrating the Lord's Supper. They had other days when they focused on that. Jews tended to fast two days a week, Mondays and Thursdays. The Christians generally, Christian Jews, generally fasted on Wednesdays and Fridays. During their love feasts, which is how they referred to the Lord's Supper. They focused on celebrating the coming, the coming of the Messiah and his victory over death. The change to dwelling on the death and suffering of Jesus happened several hundred years later. So in keeping with that early transition or tradition, I would like to read from Romans 8, starting in verse 28, uh, and help us celebrate with a glad heart uh, that Jesus came uh, and had victory over death. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, 
who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, among, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is it? Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors. Through him who loved us, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body. Let's pray for the bread. Father in heaven, we are so thankful that Jesus came. And in coming, he revealed to us what you were like. And how much you loved us, love us and how to live in a way that pleases you. Bless us as we partake of this emblem that represents his body. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on, until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful for the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from our sins that gives us a hope of eternity, worshiping you in your glory in heaven. Thank you, Father, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Stand as we sing his closing song. <clears throat> These are the days of Elijah, declaring the word of the Lord. And these are the days of your servant, Moses, righteousness being restored. And though these are days of great trials, of famine and darkness and sore, Still we are the voice in the desert, crying, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun, at the trumpet call. So lift your voice, it's the year of Jubilee, and out of Zion's hill salvation comes. Good morning. Everybody work through their turkey coma. We're all good this morning. I uh, appreciate that this morning, Jeff. It's interesting. My son and son-in-law were having one of those deep philosophical solve all the world problems questions uh, one of the nights this week around the pool table and Ecclesiastes came up. So it's one of my favorite, it is my favorite Old Testament book. So if you've not read it, I would ask you to read the whole thing 
It's only 12 chapters. Just read it. And then go back and read it again, maybe it'll highlighter, because you're going to find there's a common theme that goes through that. And it's almost word for word all the way through that I find myself repeating uh, quite often as I deal with the challenges of this life. Uh, a couple things, uh, just a reminder, uh, Jeff already mentioned the, uh, the gift cards for the school district. Um, also, uh, last week we had done some holiday baskets over Thanksgiving for people who might uh, have some needs. So the dates for those for Christmas, we do it also at Christmas. Please think about those that might benefit from a box of food over the holidays. And uh, the dates, uh, the last day to turn in that is the 11th of December, which sounds far away, but it will be here before we know it. Also, uh, Stacy and Mark Graybill are trying to get an assessment of what we have as far as interest for Bible Bowl. So please pay attention to that. Uh, see if your son or daughter is interested and let them know so we can figure out if we're gonna have a team this year. Or not. So with that, why don't we uh, close with a word of prayer? Dear Lord, thank you for the time that we've had this week uh, to relax and contemplate and think back and give thanks. We thank you for the families who have been able to spend time with. We thank you for the way that you've blessed us. We just pray that you'll be with us that this week as we leave this place, that we can be a reflection of you in all that we say and do. In Jesus' name, amen.